but generally with these salaries i've seen the most consistent salaries attached to these specialties all right so we're going to start at number 10 and work our way all the way up to number one what's up fam welcome back to the channel my name is phil sarpon if it's your first time here welcome this channel is dedicated to all things psychology wellness as well as graduate school basically what i do for this channel is that any questions that you guys have about psychology or wellness or even graduate school i make these videos and i do my best to answer those questions and so what this video is going to cover is 10 psychology fields and their salaries now We've done previous videos about all the clinical psychology specialties, the subspecialties, all the different ways that you can specialize in clinical psychology or neuropsychology. We're not gonna cover each and every one of those specialties in this video. Really what I've done is that I've just chosen 10 of the most popular or most common clinical psychology specialties and I'm going to basically give a, a cover or an overlay of all of the different types of salaries for these different specialties. Now, depending on where you go for your sources or what state that you live in, these salaries are going to fluctuate based on your experience, based on what you can offer, private practice. I mean, there's a, a ton of different things. But generally with these salaries, I've seen the most consistent salaries attached to these specialties. All right, so we're gonna start at number 10 and work our way all the way up to number one. All right, so coming at number 10, we got sports psychologists with an average yearly salary of 60 thousand dollars which is in my opinion actually really good what's cool with sports psychology is that they can work in a number of different settings whether it's related to high school or college maybe i've actually seen a lot of sports psychologists that have their own consulting services i do think that there is an opportunity with sports psychology to actually make a good amount of money especially when it comes to working with professional teams teams that are have a basketball team or have a have a professional nfl or nba or golf or whatever you want to name it i think there are a lot of sports that are actually looking towards sports psychologists in fact i think there's a lot of individual players and athletes that are also looking towards sports psychology for mental health services so i think this is definitely something a, a field or a specialty that can definitely grow over time now for all of these specialties at the end of the day in my opinion the salary doesn't really matter what matters is that you are doing what you love most that you're doing you're pursuing your interest and your passion this is really just an entertainment video just to see all the different salaries for all the different clinical psychology professions all right so next up is number nine forensic psychologists with $61,000. Now this is a specialty that a lot of you guys have expressed interest to me individually. And I do think this is also another growing field. This is a very important field. Personally, from what I've seen, this is, this is a job that is, is difficult. I actually think that they, forensic psychologists should be paid higher than a lot of other different specialties because I do think they do very important work, working in forensic settings, sometimes working in juvenile facilities. I mean, there's a lot of things that they see mental health wise in these settings that is taxing on the individual, that is taxing on both parties. So I, I do see this as something that could increase over time, but it is also definitely a very needed specialty. All right, number eight, we got school psychologist at 77,000. So this is another important field. I, I think personally, especially if you're a parent or you are thinking about having kids, the realm of, of school psychology is so apparent in a lot of different educational systems. Uh, I've mentioned before that I'm working in a neuropsychology clinical site that is specifically for pediatric neuropsychology. So a lot of what they do is that they actually, most of their populations are children are kids that are between the ages of six to 16. And most of the cases are gonna be cases where parents do take their kids to school psychologists in terms of 
whether it's IQ or whether it's assessing some type of behavior problem. I mean, there's a lot of different things with school psychologists. All right, next up, we got counseling psychologists at 81,000. So this is another one that is very similar to clinical psychologists. And I think depending on where you are in terms of the world or a country setting, you know, they may view counseling psychologists very much differently than clinical psychologists. From what I've seen, even here in the States, I think clinical and counseling psychologists are very, very similar. They learn all the same things, very similar curriculums. Actually, there's counseling psychologists even in my doctoral program along with other PsyD professors or PhD professors in clinical psychology. So at the end of the day, I think it just kind of, it, it pertains more to, again, what you want to focus on in terms of specializing or working in a particular work environment or a different population. Next up, we got clinical psychologists at 81,000. So again, you know, this is a fairly average salary. Now you are, you are gonna see some differences between the clinical psychology PhD people and the, and the PsyD people, uh, just a little bit. Actually, maybe in some situations, there's really not any difference at all, but overall, if you do your research, you are gonna see a little bit of a difference. Part of that could be that, you know, clinical psychology PhD students are technically in school a little bit longer. They do tend to go into academia more. So sometimes in academia, you know, if they become tenured professors, they could make a, a good amount of money just be, being a, a tenured professor at a doctoral level program. However, regardless, they both have to take the same licensure exams. They're both going to be licensed under the same licensing degree and things like that. So. At the end of the day, it really just matters more so what you would like to get. All right, next up, number five, I actually kind of already mentioned this, are psychology teachers. So these are gonna be your doctoral level professors, your faculty members. When you apply to these clinical psychology programs, you are mostly going to come into contact with psychologists. They're going to be licensed, either, they, either they're gonna have a PhD or a PsyD, but they are going to be particularly specific with being faculty members, being research professors, and the thing with being in the education field, especially in a doctoral level program, is that they most likely might make a little bit more than a general clinical psychologist that just really does clinical practice. So if you are primarily wanting to do academia, that is a good, kind of a good pro because yeah, you're probably gonna get paid a little bit more, especially based on your experience. I mean, if you've been teaching for 10, 15 years, the availability and the potential to make up to more than $100,000 is pretty common. Next up, we got engineering psychologists. Now, I gotta be honest with you guys. I had to do some research about what exactly are engineering psychologists. I could have missed this profession in the APA manual when they go over all the different specialties of psychology, but looking at the salary, it seems like they do some pretty important work going over $90,000 per year in terms of their salary. And as we can see, what they do is that they work in a number of different settings. They increase efficiency and productivity while minimizing injuries and risk in work environments. And so I would say that this is also a pretty important profession. I think about all the different types of careers that deal with technology and machinery and safety. So I can see how anything, anytime that I feel like a profession is coupled with technology, I feel like there's always that potential to really actually make a lot of money because technology is so prevalent in our culture and in our society today. So there you go, engineering psychologist. Yes, all right, top three, neuropsychologist over at $93,000 per year. So this makes a lot of sense because neuropsychologist do a lot of very specialized work in neurological conditions. I've mentioned previously before, I mean, these guys could either work in private practice, they could work in hospitals, but they are a profession that's very needed in the mental health field, especially because they can do a number of different psychological assessments, assessing people's cognitive abilities or conducting cognitive tests or evaluating the physical structures and functions of the brain. These guys are really important. And I think with neuropsychologists, one thing that I've, I've, I've noticed about neuropsychologists is that they are so close to kind of 
being in the medical profession, when you think about the medical profession, there is always sort of like that distinct line between understanding the physiology of the body and then understanding mental health. But with neuropsychology, they really do walk the bare line of really understanding what's going on in the brain, the anatomy, the physiology, and then using that understanding to help diagnose different neurological conditions. And so even the neuropsychologists that I've been shadowing and the clinical practice that I've been working in, I see so many times how the neuropsychologist knows a lot of different medical terminology. Obviously, when they go into the hospital, they, they understand, they can have conversations with neuroscientists, they can have conversations with neurologists and nurses and, and medical health professionals about different patients. So when it comes to neuropsychology, it does make sense that they might get paid a little bit more than clinical psychology or school psychology because they are basically almost medical doctors. They're not technically medical doctors because they're a specialty of clinical psychology, but the things that they do in the medical health field and how they couple that with mental health is, is so needed and is so impactful for a lot of different patients. All right, so coming up on the last two things, now we have industrial organizational psychologists. I've done a video about industrial organizational psychologists. This is sort of a field that is definitely growing. I have seen it personally. When I've talked to other students or I've talked to a lot of different faculty members, I've seen this field particularly more as an independent contractor. For example, a psychologist that teaches, let's say Monday through Thursday, maybe on the weekends they take on a project from a company that needs help with their employees or it needs help in the work environment. And so they take on a case where they might work with a company or maybe they, they just take on these different projects maybe twice a month or a couple times a year. I, I don't really know a lot of industrial organizational psychologists that are doing this as their main career. And I think if you look online and you research, it's really hard to figure out if this type of salary is consistent across the board with all industrial organizational psychologists or if it's only just a small percentage. So I think that's what I would say about this field. You, it looks like you, the way to become an industrial organizational psychologist is, is really more so, I mean, you're getting the same schooling with clinical psychology and then maybe you specialize in working with companies or corporations after that. But the potential to make a lot of money in this field is, is very, very large because if you work with a huge company, I mean, yeah, you could earn more than $250,000 a year, which is insane for a psychology mental health professional. So, and of course, number one is going to be psychiatry, which makes sense, right? So psychiatrists are going to go to medical school. They're gonna go into a psych psychiatric residency for a number of years, and then they're gonna get their license in psychiatry. They also work primarily with medication, which in my opinion is also probably why they make a little bit more money. So psychiatrists are medical doctors. We talked about how neuropsychology, they're like kind of like right in the midline between the medical health field and the mental health field, but psychiatrists are in the medical health field. They are medical doctors, but they do know how to do some psychological assessment. They mainly work with the medication side of things and they get paid over $200,000 yearly salary, which in my opinion makes sense. If you were to research up on psychiatry, what you're gonna notice is that they actually have in their schedule way more time to take on patients. So for example, a clinical psychologist may only see eight patients a day, you know, when it comes to therapy if they're doing assessment, I mean, sometimes assessment might take four hours, so they may only do two assessment cases a day, and they may only see seven to eight patients a day for therapy. Whereas with psychiatry, they could see people every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes, which I think that's also part of the reason why they can actually make a lot more money in this field because they see way more patients at a much faster level. But that is it guys, those are the 10 psychology professions. Those are their salaries. Let me know in the comment section below if you were surprised by any of the information that I said in this video. But with that, smash the like button, hit the bell for notifications, and I will see you guys in the next video.